Welcome to Conversations with Big Rich. This is an interview style podcast. Those interviews are all involved in the off-road industry. Being involved, like all of my guests are, is a lifestyle, not just a job. I talk to competitive teams, racers, rock crawlers, business owners, employees, media and private park owners, men and women who have found their way into this exciting and addictive lifestyle. We discuss their personal history, struggles, successes, and reboots. We dive into what drives them to stay active and off-road. We all hope to shed some light on how to find a path into this world we live and love and call off-road. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two. Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Have you seen Four Low Magazine yet? Four Low Magazine is a high-quality, well-written, four-wheel drive-focused magazine for the enthusiast market. If you still love the idea of a printed magazine, something to save and read at any time, Four Low is the magazine for you. Four Low cannot be found in stores, but you can have it delivered to your home or place of business. Visit fourlowmagazine.com to order your subscription today. On today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, we have Stephen Lutz. Stephen is the owner of Rugged Rocks Off-Road and Rugged Routes, which is a GPS mapping based off of the Lawrence system. And we'll get into all that with him and his history and everything. But right now, I'd like to say thank you, Stephen, for coming on board and uh, talking about your uh, your life in off-road and your life in general. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. I'm really glad to uh, be on the call with you. It's um... It's, it's always fun to talk about this kind of thing, and I was really glad when you reached out to me. So, yeah, let, let's get started. So, you and I met via a phone call a couple of years ago, but um, we're not that close of friends. Most of the people that I have that we've interviewed, I've, uh, I've got a pretty good history on anyway, because we've been good friends. Um, you know, we've been associates over the phone. I don't even know if we've actually met in person yet, but we're going to make that we're going to make a change on that here pretty soon, I think. And anyway, I wanted to, the first question I want to ask you is where were you born and raised? Yeah, born and raised uh, down here in Fontana, California and Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, for those of you that are listening that, that don't know where that is, it's just, uh, just outside of Ontario, California, just maybe 10 minutes from the Ontario airport is the easiest way to explain. So I'm about two hours or so from Johnson Valley and it's been going to the hammers for, a long time, more mostly for for the race, but uh, we can get more into that later. Okay, and what was it like? Uh, you're you're a lot younger um, than myself, so was it still uh, was it built up in that area? You know, was, was Ontario Ontario Raceway was never around when you were when you were a kid, were you? Was it? No, it wasn't there. Um, it was it was fairly populated when I was little but not like it is today. I used to be able to see pretty much from my hometown all the way down to the Ontario Mills Mall, and now there's no shot. Even when I tell people that are newer to the area, yeah, I used to be able to see the mall from here. They just fall over, like, there's no way. I'm like, yeah, it used to be all grapevines out here, just desert and grapevines. And over the years, they, they mow over the grapevines, and they just keep building more stuff. So the 210 freeway didn't extend through here. Uh, in fact, I did a report on that uh, in fourth grade. Like we had to do these these news uh, assignments and go find something that's like the latest news kind of thing. And I remember doing one of these weekly reports on this 210 freeway that was going to be extended and come through Rancho and Fontana, Rialto. And uh, it was like a big project, right? And we didn't see that until I was in high school. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I can yeah. remember when all that was being built. Yeah. Let's talk about school back in those days. Um, you know, what did you, were you studious or were you into sports? You did your own thing. What kind of, uh, what kind of kid did you grow up as? 
Uh, I was a nerd. A nerd. <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't even know what that word was when I was when I was a kid. Okay, I, that's how you, yeah, I'm dating not, myself. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's uh, but not a nerd in a in a typical sense of like a, a bookworm kind of nerd. Uh, I was fairly studious, but I wouldn't say I got straight A's. Um, I, I wouldn't say that that getting straight A's was my highest priority. But um, you know, I learned what I needed to learn to move on and had other interests in electronics, uh, computers, and that sort of stuff. And I, I was introduced to those things uh, by my grandfather who helped, or I guess I, I wouldn't know how to really describe this properly, but he was around when they were going from manual switchboards to computerized Unix or computer-based uh, phone systems. Okay. And he worked, he worked for Bell and GTE and like the whole chain, uh, you know, they've all been gobbled up by the, by now. But when he was going through all that, he kind of introduced me to some programming and some things like that. We didn't have a lot of resources. So a lot of the computers and stuff that I was able to get my hands on were all just uh, older hand-me-downs that were coming out of the phone company. They were, you know, uh, one man's junks, another man's treasure kind of thing. So they were getting rid of equipment and we managed to, uh, pick a couple machines up that I, I got to dabble with when I was really young. So at that point, I was probably around six years old, seven years old, something like that. And um, it just kind of never stopped. Uh, my grandpa was a electrician in the Navy and somehow ended up with uh, a, quite a bit of knowledge of low voltage electronics as well. And so he built some things. Uh, here and there uh, over time. No products or anything, but just, just things for fun. And uh, he introduced me to, to soldering and uh, basic electronics like um, uh, like Ohm's Law and that kind of stuff. So it was that was the beginning of it. Uh, in school, though, I started going to school actually out the San Gabriel Mission is a, a private school and only went there for a couple of years. Then I, uh, my mom was commuting and we were driving uh, every morning before the crack of dawn out to uh, San Gabriel from Fontana. Uh, and so my mom was uh, worked out there, dropping me off at school, all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, we did that for a few years. Then I just went to public school with some of my cousins that were local here in Fontana and Rancho and stayed in public school uh, until, well, the, the, rest of, the rest of my schooling was all public after that. Okay. So then, Doing the commute, how how long a commute was that for you and for your mom? Oh, man. It was probably an hour and a half, almost two hours every morning each wow. way. Like we were sitting in traffic the entire time. I would, my mom would wake me up in the morning, you know, I'd, I'd get dressed and uh, she'd basically carry me to the car. And I would just zonk back out in the car and the whole drive, you know, in the morning. And uh, th those mornings were really rough. Um, it, it, it was terrible. I wasn't even just in grade school because my preschool was out there as well. So I went to preschool a little early and was in preschool for two years. And then kindergarten and first grade was all out that way. And then even prior to that, uh, I had an aunt and uncle that was watching me, would take care of me uh, while my mom was at work. So uh, the whole, like, Probably, what is that, six, seven years of, of my childhood life was Commuting. that. <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. And so, yeah, it was kind of cool, though, that uh, something that came out of that was at that time in 1990, my parents bought uh, the Nissan Pathfinder, which I still own and was the foundation for starting Rugged Rocks. And we can jump into that later as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. So then you were, that's through elementary school? that you were doing that kind of commute? And after that, you were closer to home? Yes, actually starting in second grade, I was closer to home. Okay. And it was a lot better starting in second grade. So um, at that time, uh, yeah, I was able to, to get more in with like some better friends, like long-term friends. Some of those friends I still have to this day, which is awesome. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and I, I was also in, in Cub Scouts when I was going to private school. I don't know how my parents managed that on top of, you know, going back and forth. My dad did work a lot at nights, and, and he often pulled two shifts. 
he worked for the phone company as well. Uh, a lot of my family worked for the phone company. So uh, I didn't get to see my dad all that much during the week. Uh, if we got to do anything, it was always on weekends, but that was also often gobbled by a lot of family functions because I have a lot of cousins, a lot of extended family, and there was like always a birthday or something to go to. So we, uh, you know, we, we did that kind of stuff, and sometimes my dad was able to go, and sometimes he wasn't. But um, yeah, it was pretty busy when I was when I was young, regardless. Um, but but uh, jumping back to like how I was like as far as sports and anything like that wasn't ever really involved in sports but i was in in cub scouts and then boy scouts eventually made eagle scout and then uh all all through all of those times always tinkering with electronics and and that sort of thing excellent and congratulations on the eagle scout oh thanks yeah i'm an eagle as well oh fantastic yeah and uh so the high school you went to did you go at all did you go to the same high school for the whole time? I did. Yeah, I went to Etiwanda High School. I uh, was there the whole time. And uh, oddly enough, um, <laughs> I don't know if we should put this in, but oddly enough, I didn't walk. I didn't walk on time. And <laughs> speaking of how studious I was, uh, I had I'd never failed a class before. But of course, the one time I failed something, it was my second semester, senior year, English. And I was never a big fan of English, but I feel like, even to this day, looking back on that, I was just as serious about that class as my teacher was teaching it. And unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, she had the final say, so the joke was on me. So that was unfortunate. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I, uh, <laughs> I got through... English classes in high school because I was on yearbook staff. Okay. I was the yearbook photographer. I did no writing, you know, except for keeping notes. So, you know, it's, uh, there's a reason that uh, Shelly edits everything that I write. <laughs> okay, right on. Well, the funny thing is, is like, I don't mind writing. I just didn't like the way that class was being conducted and it felt like a waste of time. So anytime I'm learning something, I don't want, I don't think school should be done for the sake of trying to get straight A's. I should I think it should be done for actually getting an education. And if I were to go to a class and I don't feel like I'm actually getting an education, then it's hard for me to do that just for points and grades. Right. And it, it just feels like a waste. Like I have better things to do. And fortunately, I, I went to a, a pretty good high school. Etiwanda is historically known for, for being a pretty good school. But just like in anything else, you have a few bad apples. And unfortunately, I feel like that particular English teacher was uh, falling in that category. So, you know, what do you do? You know, life goes on. I, uh, I didn't walk. And everybody was surprised by that because I, I guess looking back at it, people felt like I had my head on pretty straight and had good things going, you know, rattling around up there. And so when people showed up to graduation, they're like, hey, where's where's Steven? And uh, I was like, hey guys, like I, you know, I, I didn't make the cut. <laughs> so I uh, didn't, you know, didn't walk, but they let me do everything else. I, I got to go to, to Brown and, and got to go to- Grad um, night and all that. Grad night and all that stuff. Yeah, I just wasn't allowed to walk. But I heard it was terrible. It was really hot. The sun was out, you know, in, in full force. And uh, But I, I do uh, wish I was there to, to take pictures with my friends because seeing all the pictures, uh, hitting the Internet later on and, and everything was, was a bummer to not be part of that. So that was unfortunate. But at the end of it, I was able to uh, crank through some, some summer school and basically walked in on day one. I said, hey, I, I start school in like four or five weeks, something like that. And I just need all of the work you need me to do throughout the summer. I just need it right now. And I walked out with like a, a two and a half foot pile of books and paper and packets and anything you can imagine associated with that type of work. And uh, just cranked through all of it and turned it in, picked up my high school diploma like the day, the day before I was supposed to start school and uh, walked in got, you know, finished registering and all that stuff and, and started going to school for electronics engineering uh, at DeVry. Okay. 
And is DeVry still in business today? No, and it's a good thing they're not. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. At the time when I started, I felt like it was a really good thing. Uh, I, I walked in, uh, you know, I kind of did a tour. Uh, I was over here in Pomona right next to Mount Sac. And it, I, I was really excited by all of the high-end equipment that I did not have access to prior to this. Right, Because I had been tinkering with electronics for so long, but I didn't have the stuff I needed to really build awesome stuff, right? Like you need test equipment and all sorts of other things. So I was like, man, I want to come here. And I saw the classes and it, it was minimally focused on gen ed, but then you're able to, you know, jump right into the meat and potatoes of, of your area of study straight out of the gate. And I, I really liked that. So it started out good for the first few years, but there was something in the air after probably a year and a half, two years. And I was like, something's not right here. So I did learn a fair amount, but then I remember sitting in a class talking about microcontrollers and stepper motors, which is basically like the, the basis of like building anything electromechanical. You make things move like robots. We said that's like the most simplistic way to explain it. And I was sitting in there and something was presented on the board and everything else just kind of clicked. And I just wanted to close my book right there and just walk out of school and be like, I don't need to come to school tomorrow because everything makes sense now. My brain seems to operate in a way of having this goal of figuring out how things work and then taking kind of this top down approach. So rather than learning foundational knowledge and then building up to the top, I kind of just start at the top and work my way down through a bunch of things that I really don't understand until I hit something I do understand and then start working my way back up. And on the way back up, it comes together really fast because you've already exposed yourself to a bunch of stuff. And then the, the you know, everything just starts to click. And that's, that's just the way I, I learn better. So even going into school, it was difficult for me to take the bottom up approach. So I, have a lot of questions and a lot of curiosity and a lot of that has has fed my my thirst for knowledge of sorts and just figuring things out so that day i just wanted to close the book and just leave but i did want to finish overall you know i wanted that piece of paper said i got my ee degree so um i ended up after that i kind of fell behind on credits and i was tired a lot um i was overworking myself with numerous things actually including started rugged rocks so i started rugged rocks and it was just a simple website at the time but then i was going to school and i was working for another e-commerce company called mxbike.com which isn't really around anymore but i helped them uh, float for probably a couple years before I stopped working there. And I just had a lot going on. It was all stuff I was interested in, but it was just too much. So I started getting behind in school and I, I took a year off. You know, statistically, they say, you know, if you take a year off, uh, you're, you're probably not coming back. And I told myself, I'm not gonna be a statistic. I will definitely come back. So I had, I took the year and when I went back a year later, I was registering just maybe like a week late, uh, a week later than I should have been. I like barely was missing the boat. And I was trying to work with them like, hey, like I need to come back, but you know, like what can you guys do? And, and I was, classes were basically starting when I was trying to register. And classes weren't full or anything like that. They, they could have gotten me in, but they were kind of playing hardball in, in saying that you know, you missed the boat and we can't do it. And I was like, well, let me just talk to these professors and if they'll let me start, you know, a couple days late, because even starting a week late is only a couple class meetings. And it's not that big of a deal to catch up on, you know, right out of the gate like that. So I was willing to do it, but they said no. And not only that, because you were gone for over a year, a bunch of the credits that you have accrued through these other classes you took are no longer valid for your degree. So we're basically going to have to take you back in time 
and knock another like year or so off of what you've already done. And uh, I was pretty upset by that. Uh, this guy's right. You should be. You're right. Yeah, it was just completely unreasonable. And so I, I was really mad. And I, I did not go back after that because um, I just couldn't believe what had happened. So I, I never went back after that. And and they would call me. You know, They would have these new hires that are looking back through their records of who's gone to school who didn't finish school, what's keeping them from finishing school, and try to loop those people back in. And every summer, they would call me, and they would basically hear the story I just told you, and then they would say, that's not right. There's no way the school did that. And I'm like, okay, well, if you can give me my credits back, but they were basically sweeping off my record, I'll come back. And they're like, okay, let me see what I can do. And they would always call me back like a week later, be like, you know, I hate to tell you this, but you're right. And there's nothing I can do. And it's not right. But that's the way it is. So um, it was really unfortunate. But that's that, that that was the end of my schooling. But that didn't keep me from pursuing the interest in electronics further on my own. I've done a lot of programming and electronics stuff since then. So I had some fairly decent uh, knowledge uh, from the time that I did spend at DeVry, but I, I didn't get the full education that I was hoping to get from there. Right. Okay. And that's, and that's not necessarily a bad thing either, depending on, on, you know, where you're taking yourself, um, you know, being that you're self-employed, um, or at least with the off-road stuff, I don't know if you have a secondary or a a primary job besides that, but you know, you're, uh, knowing, knowing what you know, you know, it doesn't always have to have, you know, that stamp of approval by some university or college or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And it, I think in the long run, it, it ended up kind of being a blessing in disguise because the school did end up going downhill. Uh, like I had mentioned, like something was in the air, things were changing people, from high up places were touring the campus and it was just like something, something feels wrong. And then they started like changing curriculum and stuff. And it wasn't, um, it, it just it, think, I didn't know all the ins and outs, but something smelled funny. Right. And, uh, at the end of it, you know, the DeVry ended up in a bunch of lawsuits and all sorts of stuff that I don't know the ins and outs of, but it, it's probably, for the best that they're not around anymore. Right. I had my degree is in commercial photography and product advertising. And the college that I went to um, was called Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara. And it was, it was one of the top three rated photography school in the nation um, behind art center in, in LA and then uh, the Rochester Institute of Photography in uh, back in New York. And they they got in trouble for predatory loan and got loans and then got um de you know they they their accreditation got removed and decertified or whatever and they ended yeah. up you know it what when it was a private school and was owned by a family the Brooks family it was great and then they got old enough that they said okay we're going to sell out to you know I guess like an investment firm or another college or something. And those guys just screwed it up. Yeah. Yeah. DeVry was privately owned as well. And I think something along those same lines had happened. They at one point did get uh, their, their accreditation uh, pulled. And I did end up trying to go to Cal Poly, but it was always a very complicated thing trying to cross over classes to see what credits they were able to keep and that sort of stuff. And then at the end of it, they said, we, we recommend you take care of some things at a community college and then come back in like a year. And when I went to the local community college here, it was just like high school all over again. And I, I just, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I just couldn't. Right. So I was like, no, I'm just, I'm done. I'm done. So yeah, it's unfortunate that the schools like that, that have a good reputation at first end up, 
falling short and um it just ends it just ends poorly and it, it's really unfortunate i had some contacts in some some aerospace companies and they had i was asking about like devry versus itt tech versus you know your traditional four-year college and that sort of stuff and the people that went to devry like way before me came out with really really solid educations Sometimes I would hear that there was a little, like a small gap in knowledge here and there, but there was different small gaps in knowledge with people coming from other avenues of education as well. So it was kind of like more or less on the same plane. Right. But yeah, it was just, it just went down in a fiery blaze and that was that. <laughs> so then you're, uh, you get back to the, the, the working you started Rugged Rocks in 2006? That's correct. Yeah, 2006. Uh, at the time, uh, it actually was officially, I started building the website after a snowboarding accident. Uh, I had I had messed up my knee pretty bad where I had a full leg cast for about a month and a half, and I was pretty much useless. So uh, I had been wanting to start uh, the website and, and start selling Nissan parts. And that, that was the other thing, right? It's very Nissan focused. So uh, I built the website uh, on the couch and to hobble around on crutches and do really do anything else was challenging. So I, I took the time to, to start the business. My girlfriend's mom at the time actually was the one that drove me around to file the paperwork and, and get the business license and resell cert and all that stuff going. And, um, yeah, that's, that's how it, it very much originated from there. And, uh, if it wasn't for having that injury and, and having my butt sit down on that couch for a month and a half, I don't know if I would have ever gotten it off the ground. Yeah. Cause it, you, uh, was that, I guess you were a snowboard instructor after that. After yeah, it was injury? after that. Okay. I was, uh, huh. And what was that like? We'll get back to the, the off-road here, but what was it like being a, a ski instructor? You were at Big Bear one season and then Kirkwood another? Yep, exactly. Uh, I man, It was so much fun. So I started out, they had this job fair uh, up at uh, Bear Mountain, and it, but Big Bear and Bear Mountain became the same entity. So went up there, everybody was just standing in line for a job, and I didn't know what I wanted to do on the mountain. I just wanted a season working on the mountain because I, I never got that experience of like going away to college or like moving out of town to just kind of go do my own thing. And working on a mountain always just seemed fun to me. So I was there standing in line and this guy came out. And he's like, anybody want to be an instructor? And I was like, oh, I'll teach. That sounds fun because you're on the snow all day. And it was just kind of a spur of the moment thing. I just raised my hand. He pulled me out of line and and the rest was history there. He signed me up. I uh, did, did uh, a couple checks with my boss, just making sure I can actually ride. And then they started teaching me how to teach. And it was fun, but Bear Mountain gets really crowded being in Southern California. We get a little bit of snow and everybody just rushes up to the mountains and it's just packed. So <laughs> the classes became a little chaotic, uh, but but got through it and you end up with a season pass. So on days you're not working, you can go ride. And being that the business was very, very new, I didn't have uh, firm obligations on a daily basis. So uh, I would often take off for like a morning during the week and I would go, go for a ride. And so that was pretty cool. The following season, I went to Kirkwood. Uh, me and a friend that she had been snowboarding for a long time and had previously lived in Tahoe and done uh, ski instructing and stuff uh, prior to to even us working. She was actually there with me at the job fair and also got a job. But um, she had been through it before. She's a, she's a handful of years older than me. And it, we, we just knew each other. We're just friends, mutual friends kind of thing. And um, we're just like, hey, you know, it sounds fun. So we we did that. Um, I started looking for jobs up north to go to a bigger mountain and she wasn't going to go, but I really wanted to do it. And then she had a, a turn of events with her primary job 
So uh, overnight, it seemed like, well, I just lost my job, got laid off. So let's go to Tahoe. Started looking for, for a spot that there, ended up at Kirkwood. They essentially hired us via email. And then we made a few trips up there to to find a place to live and um, go meet you know the people on the mountain and that sort of stuff. But Kirkwood was probably the single most best experience of my life. It was it snowed so much that season. There was sixty four feet of snowfall that that season. Wow. Yeah, it snowed like three feet like every other day. I woke up at 4.30 in the morning to tractors coming through the parking lot of the condo complex we were living in, just swooping out the snow, like pretty much every morning. It was insane. So because of that, there was a lot of like the, the typical tourism stuff that brings a lot of people into the mountain on buses. A lot of that kind of stuff got canceled. Even during the holidays and busy seasons, a lot of that was kind of dampened. So I'm sure the mountain was probably hurting financially that year. But as employees being up there, it was fantastic because when there was no one to teach, it just turned into time to free ride. And we were just snowboarding in knee to waist deep, fresh, light, dry powder the whole time. It just, it was endless. It was absolutely endless and to this day I still want to pinch myself and question if that whole thing actually happened because I've never snowboarded in conditions like that again in my whole life. <laughs> and and Kirkwood is is not an easy resort to get to. I mean it is it, compared to all the other resorts out in the Tahoe area. Um, you know, you I mean they run everything off of generators, or at least they used to. I'm not sure if they They've gotten on the power grid yet um, or had by then. But I can remember going up there and skiing and being stuck on on ski lifts for like, I think there was one season where I paid for one ticket one day and got enough free tickets to ride to keep going to Kirkwood like seven or eight times that year because the the generators would shut off. Or the yep. chairlist would break, and you'd sit there for an hour or two, and so they'd give you a, a complimentary ticket. Yeah, and as far as I know, they're still running on generators. I think they have a handful of large uh, diesel generators uh, made by Cat. So, yeah, that's that's how they run everything. Everything from ski lifts to power for the the restaurants that are there, the housing that's there. I mean, they have a pretty good sized little community back in this canyon. And it's it's all off the grid. That's pretty cool. I, I I always loved it there. It was just a pain to get to. <laughs> yeah, it was it was brutal. There was some times where we were driving up, and so we were living in in South Lake Tahoe and had to make that commute. Well, I wasn't working on the mountain every day, so I was still building rugged rocks during the week and doing working the business there. Uh, but then I would leave for Wednesday afternoons to get um, ASSI. Is that what it is? Uh, the uh, snowboard teaching accreditation classes. I would go go do those on Wednesday afternoons. And then on the weekends, I would I would teach. And then the, the rest of the time, I was still running the business from up there. So. It was kind of cool how I had that worked out. But when we were driving up to the mountain, I remember one time there was, they had just plowed the roads. Like they were saying the highway was closed on the signs, but then we were getting about ready to turn around and the sign switched and we're like, oh, like it just opened. So we went, but then unfortunately that highway essentially dead ended because the jurisdictions between two different parts of Caltrans weren't well communicated that day. So you literally, <laughs> you're literally driving down the highway and then there's a gate that's closed and just a wall that's about five or six feet high of just fresh untouched snow. So we just sat there waiting for the snow plows to, to show up coming from the other direction to open the gate. They eventually did. So we were a little late to work that day, but that wasn't that big of a deal because nobody else was there anyhow. So yeah, you know, I couldn't get there. 
That had um, to be with, that had to be Highway 88. <laughs> uh, it probably was. Yeah, coming up from the south as we were yeah. heading south. Yeah. So it was it was interesting having those types of experiences uh, for sure. And but the riding there was absolutely phenomenal. Got to hunt, hang out with a lot of really cool people. And uh, I've been back to visit a couple of times since, and it's it's just always a good time to ride that mountain. Cool. So let's let's talk about the Nissan and how that all came about. You said it was a family car. It was, yeah. It's how I got to preschool. It's how I got to you know the, all those all those years of commuting uh, was was me pretty much <laughs> zonk out in the back seat <laughs> just trying to go to school. <laughs> So, yeah, that was my mom's car. And then later on when I, I got my driver's license, um, I didn't have a car of my own yet. So me and my mom were sharing a car somehow. I don't remember exactly how that was working at first. But we would, you know, we would each drive it when she was gone to work. Um, you know, obviously I didn't have access to it. So I was still getting a ride from from friends or other people or sometimes just walking to school even after I was driving. I just didn't have a car. So eventually my mom bought a more commuter friendly car, uh, a Honda Civic. And then I ended up inheriting the Pathfinder. So it was two wheel drive at the time and, you know, stock tires, basically stock everything. My dad had put in like some BFGs on it because we did grow up um, going dirt bike riding on occasion. Uh, so it was kind of on and off. I did get my first dirt bike when I was five. So I wasn't new to the dirt when I started driving. Um, but besides, uh, you know, some some BFG all-terrains, that Pathfinder was was bone stock. Um, my dad had a separate truck that we would go camping in and stuff. It was an old Ford. And uh, as far as the Pathfinder goes, I really just wanted to use it to get get to the mountain to go snowboarding and then eventually i was like i want four wheel drive but i don't want to get rid of the pathfinder there's so much history here and i enjoy driving it my first car i want to keep it so i had jumped on the nissan forums there's a forum called Empora. it stands for nissan pathfinder off-road association okay and tons of information on that forum at the time there was a fair amount of information but there was still a lot of gaps and stuff so i i seemed to have found another interest that it was a puzzle, I think, in my head. Like there was a lot of people that were wanting to do more off-road with their Nissans, but had limited access to parts or the parts that were available from various companies in the industry weren't well distributed or even known about, well advertised for that matter. So when I started Rugged Rocks, I had basically started fixing up the Pathfinder and was bringing in or bringing the, the parts that were available that many people just didn't know about into a central place that that then they could be purchased from. And, and that was the Rugged Rocks website. So that that was the very, very beginnings of it. But eventually I bought another Pathfinder that had been really beat up and I think it was like stuck in Azusa Canyon, like in the <laughs> creek crossing for multiple days from what I understand. And it just basically used it for the drivetrain, um, moved over all the four wheel drive components, swapped the transmission and, and all that stuff and converted it to a four wheel drive vehicle using all factory parts. And it, it might sound complicated, but it was actually fairly straightforward. Besides modifying a cross member, for the four wheel drive trans and welding in just two brackets to add a cross member for the, the front diff, everything else bolted right together. So it was actually really smooth. And me, me and my dad had done that. We'd done that in his, his garage. Uh, by the way, my, my parents had split up when I was in like fourth grade. So after that, you know, I was living this whole, uh, you know, split up family double life thing. But by the time I was in high school, uh, he had uh, some garage space made available so we could do this four wheel drive conversion. So that worked out pretty well. And hence the, your, uh, your interest in, in off-road at that point. 
Absolutely. So it really just started out as I want four-wheel drive so I can go snowboarding. And then once I realized what else I could do with four-wheel drive, uh, the, you know, the, <laughs> the, I don't know what you want to call it, but the, the interest would just peaked and there was just no stopping after that. So you, you, you worked with guys that had were already fabbing parts and became kind of like the, the store for those other guys, or did you start doing some of that stuff yourself? So I wasn't fabricating anything. I was just getting the stuff that was already available. So like Rancho, even to this day, like they still have shocks for those older trucks that were made in the nineties. Uh, Superlift used to make upper control arms for the old hard body pickups and pathfinders. And so I was selling those and they, like they were available. I mean, Superlift, you were able to get through full parts and uh, various other mom and pop off-road shops but nobody knew about the Nissan stuff just because they weren't common. And it wasn't even that they weren't in the catalog, just nobody asked for Nissan stuff very much in each of these stores, so nobody knew about it. So I would you know, start digging up these things that were available, just lesser known. And I just pulled those together first. And then as I started doing other things to so the Pathfinder, um, I started working with some of these companies to bring other parts out. And at one point I, me and a friend of mine, his name's Kenny, we were doing, um, you know, that's when we started really getting in heavy and solid axle swaps and um, other things, but then worked with advanced adapters on bringing the Atlas adapter out. And um, what else did I do at the time? Doug Thorley, uh, the history of headers for Nissan's has kind of been stop and go over the years just because of demand. It's like, they want to discontinue the part, but then after a short amount of time, there's enough people that want them again because demand is building. So now they have enough interest to do another run of them. So it's kind of an interesting um, history there with trying to keep some of that stuff in production. It's, it's always been a bit of a game juggling what people are interested in right now in the Nissan world and what they're not. So it, it's been challenging for sure, but uh, at the time, being that I started so young, I, I didn't have a lot of financial requirements right out of the gate when I was first building the website and doing all of this. So it was definitely a, a really slow build of, of just getting momentum going and, and all of that. But and about probably 10 years ago, eight years ago, there was still a lot of people building like the second gen Xterras and Frontiers where nobody knew what they were doing with these trucks. Like there's a lot of investigating and figuring what's going to work, what's not going to work. And somehow I've managed to stay on the forefront of a lot of that as the generations of trucks have, have come out with the exception of the latest Frontier to some degree. I've dabbled with that a little bit, but not in as deep as I have with previous generations. Did you find that it was uh that even the companies that you were dealing with to supply the parts, especially somebody like Skyjacker or Rancho, um, that they may have the part numbers, but people didn't know much about those parts because they weren't, you know, yeah. as popular as maybe Toyota or Chevy, Ford, or Jeep parts? Absolutely. Getting support for pretty much anything Nissan, even through the manufacturer, is it's been historically difficult. So it was very much up to me to figure it out and then become kind of that support person. And that was, it was good in some ways, but difficult in other ways, because then I became like this mastermind Nissan resource and my phone would ring off the hook with just technical questions rather than people actually buying parts. Right. So I know these things. Yeah. So I know these things pretty well, but over the years, uh, yeah, it, it's gotten even worse actually. So those upper control arms from Superlift, they ended up discontinuing them. Um, at one point, they mm -hmm. called me and they were like, "Hey, how many of these do you see, you know, going out the door, you know, this year?" And I gave a number, and you know, it was fairly consistent, but ultimately it, it didn't make the cut 
And right when I found out that they were planning on discontinuing the part again, I tried buying the jig from them so we can just fab them up ourselves. But by the time that phone call was made, uh, they had already gotten rid of the jig. Everything was in the dumpster and they completely called it quits on that part. And there was no coming back. So I dealt with some of that stuff as well. Wow. It's amazing that, that a company would, would get rid of jigs. I thought the same thing. Uh, I had a guy check on it. I was like, oh, I'll buy the jig off of you because the hard work is done. You know, it's just if I can have the jig, we'll keep it going. And it, it was relatively small quantities that were going outdoor. But if you can sell a lot of things at low quantity, then, you know, it's essentially the same thing as selling fewer things at high quantity. And, you know, it, it's always kind of just been the way it's had to be with Nissan stuff. But, uh, yeah, he, he tried. He's like, I'm gonna, I'll go see what I could do. And they called me back. And they're like, everything's gone. Like it's, it's gone and there's just nothing I could do. Hard stop. I was just like, well, it's, is what it is at that point. So did you have to, do you, do you have a source for them now? I don't, uh, I get calls on them occasionally, um, just a few times a year now. Okay. Uh, I know Cal mini still advertises them. I don't know if they're still making, uh, and the, those Nissan parts, uh, I know for, for Cal mini, it's even become a bit of a slow mover so for them to make nissan parts as a priority in their production line has also been challenging at least that's what it's seemed like over the years okay so i know they have a lot going on up there and it it makes sense that that nissans aren't at the top of the list right yeah they're just just not quite as popular a vehicle not as not the quantity out there that that the that some of the others have yeah, exactly. And it's a bummer that that's the case because how many actually turns out some really nice stuff for the Nissans, but they just, you know, again, they they can't make it a priority and, and I don't blame them for it. it. It makes sense. Right. So let's talk about rugged routes. Okay. Your mapping. That's, uh, that's something that, that I'm really starting to dive into a lot more. I mean, I've always... It seems like I've had a Lowrance since almost, well, I didn't have one in 2003 when I went to Baja the first time, but it was shortly thereafter I got the first uh, first Lowrance. And I loved it because no matter where I went, I could always get back out. Yep, absolutely. And I was first introduced to Lowrance just through the grapevine, knowing that guys were racing with them. And I'm not a racer, but I just figured, well, if the guys are racing with these things, it must be good, right? And they're great pieces of equipment, fantastic. But when I got my first one, I was bummed out about the map availability. And with my history with computers and electronics and everything else, I figured there, there's got to be a way to fix this. Right. And started making phone calls. And actually I had a friend that was managing the Marine department at the local Bass Pro Shops here in Rancho. And he was like, you know, the data in the most simplistic form, he like really dumbed it down and he, he knew this stuff fairly well. And he kind of ran through like how the data worked. He didn't know all the ins and outs of it, but he knew the, the basis of it. He's like, so maybe just try calling Lawrence and see if, you know, they can help you out or get started with it. Because they said they get people in there all the time looking for the Baja units in the store. You don't typically carry them. They would get them on occasion. But there's there's a need there, especially locally. And you just see what happens. And so I, I started making some phone calls. And I got a hold of a department that was beta testing some software. This was back in like 2013, I think. Okay. So I called over there and I told him like, Hey, you know, you guys aren't going to have to walk my hand. We're going to hold my hand with everything on this process, but I know this is possible. I know the software is there. I know you guys are doing this, this, and that. I just need to know what I can do or how this is done so I can apply the mapping methodologies to the off-road world. And it was just pure dumb luck, good timing. There was a guy that was heading up this department that was helping 
some marine companies do mapping and they were beta testing some new software. So they, you know, I had to sign some NDAs and stuff and, and uh, got my hands on this software and started dabbling with it. And the first one I did was the Johnson Valley map. And originally when I went into doing this, I didn't have the idea or the goal of spinning off a new part of the business or anything like that. It was just like, I want maps. I want to be able to put stuff together for my own personal use. And so I built one for Johnson Valley and the first completed map that I did, I, I was out in the truck one day and I was just staring at it on the GPS. I was just like, holy cow, like this is too good. People are going to want this. I surprised myself. And then I, I just spun up a real simple website seemingly overnight. I think it only took me, programmed most of it in one night and got it up and running using some other software that was already available. And about a week later, I took my first order without really advertising anything. And then the, the ball was rolling from there. So did San Bruno National Forest and then built a few others. And it just uh, has snowballed quite a bit ever since. Uh, there has been a fair amount of things that have just happened in my life over the last handful of years that kept me from really moving forward with building new maps. And that's always been the biggest problem. Like people love my products, but they want more of it. And so there, I had quite a few roadblocks in the not so, not so far off past that was keeping me from really dedicating a lot of time to, to doing that. But things are changing and I'm really looking forward to, to building more. Cool. And so what you have available now, you have, um, of course you have, Johnson Valley, the hammers. Yep. And that, that'll help people get to each one of the, the existing trails, correct? Yep, exactly. So all the, the main historically famous uh, hammers trails are on there, as well as a handful of others. There are some trails out there now that have been broken just in the last couple of years that I don't have tracks on. So I do need to go back out there, spend some time and, and get that updated. Really, I need I recognizing the need and needing to redo Johnson Valley. Um, you know, a fair amount of time has passed to where the quality of the imagery, uh, I could do a little bit better on that. And then just things have changed. Uh, the, the trails, the main trails that are on the map there currently are still very valid, but there's been a lot added and I, I need to spend some time out there. So yeah, every, we'll do that. Every year there's people breaking new, new canyons or faces out there that they turn into trails. Yeah. And it's all just word of mouth. Like there's no good database for all of these trails. It's just kind of, you're either in the loop or you're not in the loop and it's hard to keep up on who's doing what, you know, what's a good trail, what's worth running and tra tracking, what's not. And there's just so much out there now that it's it's time for, for a redo on that one for sure. Right. And then you have Glamis? I do have Glamis. That one has all the, the major points of interest. Uh, although the satellite imagery on that is not as crucial for navigating out there, Having something that has all the the main points of interest and the places to camp, all the washes marked, stuff like that is very crucial, especially for the guys that ride out there at night. I'm not a dune guy myself, but I know enough of them and have talked to enough people over the years to understand the problems that they face when riding the dunes when it comes to navigation. It Because of the way you have to kind of surf the dunes and especially doing it at night, you can get turned around really, really, really fast. So having this product has helped a ton of people. And I've heard stories time and time again, most commonly in Johnson Valley and Glamis, where a customer of mine will be out riding with a group of friends, they will all be lost. And then somebody pipes up thinking they know where they need to go. And it's wrong. <laughs> yep. And then my customer says like, nope, I know where we're going, just follow me. And then everybody's in doubt and be like, no, it's this way. Just trust me, I got it on the GPS. They show back up at camp and everybody's just shocked 
you know? <laughs> and it's, so it's just kind of funny that that, that kind of stuff, that especially this day and age, uh, still happens in that people get that disoriented uh, in the outdoors like that. Well, in Glamis, it's even in midday, you know, from 11 to 1, or even, you know, about 10 to 2, you might say, it's, uh, it can be, it can be hard to, to know where you're at, especially if you're out in the middle there. Um, you know, we do, I do the rebel rally and going, you know, working at staff and as part of the course crew. And I kind of wander the fringes and don't go into the very be- in. I've, you know, I've never been to Oldsmobile or the swing set and, I, because I, I've not been shown the way out there. There's no, you know, there's nothing that's on my Lawrence that says that's where it's at. Get to that point. And, you know, even, you know, this year with the Raptor and last year, you know, it, it's, uh, the Raptors made the sand dunes much more enjoyable for me, but now it's like, uh, you know, at least with my Lawrence, if I go someplace to a checkpoint that I need to go pick up or, or get to, you know, I can, I can get there, but I can get back. And that's, that's the main thing with Lawrence that I've always used it for. Absolutely. Getting back. And that's, that's the number one thing when people call me, they're looking for, and they're like, can I just get back to camp? Like, absolutely. You can trace everywhere you've been. You can organize all the, the tracks that you've created throughout the day. You can mark your own waypoints and all of that data is overlaid on top of any of my maps that you might have inserted in the GPS as well. So it, it layers together and can handle a a good amount of data. So it's, it's become very favorable over the years as well as just being a reliable piece of equipment that was made to be outside. A lot of people just coming into this don't know, but eventually figure out, uh, and I'm very transparent about this as well. Lorentz is primarily a marine company, but these devices have been made to be able to withstand very cold temperatures, very hot temperatures, be out in direct sunlight, have a wide viewing angle of the screen, and be able to take on lots of shock and vibration, and therefore typically stand up for a very long time. Yeah, if, if people have never been, been in the marine environment on boats... Um, especially out in the ocean, they they have no clue on what those things that that the amount of impact those things will take. Um, Absolutely, it's now, brutal. Yeah, and now in a in a trophy truck situation, well, not even trophy truck. I'd say more like a class uh, eleven, <laughs> you know, with limited suspension. You know, any of the limited classes, they take even more of a beating, and uh, it's you know, I've never had one fail on me. It rarely happens. Rarely. What uh, What other areas do you have available besides? Um... Besides those, yeah. So I've got uh, Ocotillo Wells, which is a really high detail one. I finished that one up last year, and I reran all the trails there. Did uh, embedded some photos into some of the points of interest that are out there, so you can kind of check it out before you make the trek. Uh, that one worked out really well. The most recent one is one that is going to serve a a wider purpose than being just specific to an OHV area is state by state forest service topo maps. So, yeah, so that has turned out really nice. I only launched that and put that up on the website, made that available about a month ago. And I started kicking them out the door pretty quick when I first launched them, and I've been getting really good feedback on them. Uh, in fact, I got an email yesterday from a guy that was just thrilled that he had that in his GPS. So uh, I have that for most of the Western United States. Uh, those can be found on the website. There's a whole list there uh, for the U.S. Forest Service topo maps. Um, trying to think what else I have in there right now. I have a basic USGS topo map that covers the whole country. It's not super high detail, but it's much better than what comes in the Lowrance just out of the box, the base map. So it's something to get you started if you're somebody that jumps around a lot and goes to 
a lot of various areas. Maybe I don't have a high resolution map for th these other areas that you're visiting, but it's definitely a, a good foundation for, for that white area. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm trying to think actually, Rich, what, uh, <laughs> I kind of losing track of them too. I have some stuff that's out in Moab. I have some stuff in Arizona, but I need to get out and do some some really high res ones for uh, Havasu and like the Arizona Strip. I do have plans to do um, Sand Hollow. Sand Hollow is a big one that is really high on my list. But as far as other ones that are available now, I'm actually pulling up the website because I have too many things rattling around in my head. There's no problem. That's that's why we have those resources. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Ocotillo, Glamis, Johnson Valley, the San Bernardino National Forest. That was one that I spent a lot of time on. Not much has changed up there since I've made that map, although I've had that map for quite some time now. But everything is color-coded according to the difficulty, like the signs that are actually on the trail. So that turned out really nice, as well as color coding like 50 inch tracks and single tracks for dirt bikes. Although my maps aren't typically used on those vehicles, it's nice to have the, the data. So I do have quite a few things that are going to be coming down the pipe. And I'm, I'm getting really excited about some stuff. If I have a customer that wants high resolution satellite imagery for an area that I don't currently have covered, I can do custom satellite overlays as well. And I've been doing a lot of those lately just because people travel all over the place and they ride all over the place, especially in states like Arizona where there aren't firm boundaries where you can and can't ride OHV. It becomes a very complex problem for me to solve on my end as far as how big these maps are going to be, what kind of boundaries I'm going to use. Because the amount of data that these satellite images take up on disk is absolutely huge. And I can't do, let's say a whole state on one card. Right. So, and, and it, the amount of processing power that it takes to even convert all of this stuff into the Lorentz format, which is extremely efficient, by the way, if there's any techies out there questioning how this is done, everything is done in tiles. And then these tiles get down sampled into different layers, but then they get compressed extremely, extremely tight multiple times. And it becomes a lossless compression process, but there's multiple types of compression involved. So I will start out with a data set that's about 200, you know, 200 plus gigabytes and get it squeezed down to about 32 gigs. Wow. And yeah, so the, the setback that we have right now is the 32 gigabyte SD card limit on the Lowrance. Uh, so there are some ways that I've gotten around that limit in the past, but it's not officially supported. So I stay away from it unless there's a really big need for it, uh, such as some maps that I've done for Cal Fire as well. I've done some stuff that they're using in dozers, most prominently up in Northern California, actually up right around where you guys are at. Okay. And and so when there's a forest fire, they're actually using a lot of my stuff to um, to cut the fire lines. Excellent. I'd like to to help you with getting the word out on that through Four Low. So we need to to talk some more about that as well. Absolutely. I actually have a, a shipping label already printed on my desk to get some stuff up to you. I just haven't compiled everything I want to get up your way yet. So, okay. <laughs> get Glamis yeah. in there because I'm going to Glamis here in October. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I could definitely do that. Excellent. Um, so what is, uh, besides mapping and um, the products on Rugged Rocks, are, is there any expansion in those? You know, I know it, with the mapping, of course, there is a lot of expansion, but are you going to dive in continue diving in with the rugged rocks? Yeah, there's a few projects there that I that have come to the, the table recently. Uh, there's still some locker projects on the table with various manufacturers. One of the ones most recently was doing the front locker and do that test install. I did a test install for a front locker on the, the new frontier. 
So uh, even though it's very similar to the previous generation of trucks, there were some changes that needed some attention and test fit. So was able to, uh, to get that addressed very recently. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's some possibility that Rugged Rocks will end up expanding into some parts outside the Nissan world, but we'll see how that goes. We'll know more on that in the next six months, probably. Okay. So, yeah, it's, uh, that's up in the air at the moment, but there's, there's a strong possibility. Yeah, so as far as Rugged Routes goes, uh, expansion there, um, I'm tapping a little bit more into my electronics knowledge and... About a year, well, when we first got into COVID, so almost two years ago now, there's the CVT belt temp sensor for side-by-sides because that's a really big problem on those cars uh, with, with the heat generation with the CVT clutches. Right. So we can plug in the this belt temp sensor to the Lorentz system similar to how the external antennas plug in and allows you to, to display the temperature of the belt right on the screen of the Lowrance. So you're going to see more stuff like that. Uh, one of those things is bridging data from the diagnostic ports onto the Lowrance. So that's, that's one thing. So you can get RPM and engine temp and all that sort of stuff. So I think that'll be really useful for people building custom cars from the ground up. And that way they don't have to put uh, individual gauges or maybe even replace other solutions that that are on the market where they're running a Lowrance and something else, maybe they'll uh, consider just running the Lowrance system. And a lot of these race cars, they're running two Lowrances anyways, and it's very highly configurable at that point. Well, um, that will be cool. Yeah, so I think that's gonna be a, a pretty big hit. I, I have mentioned that and have that as a pending product listed on the website just to try to gauge interest. So I do get calls on that on occasion, uh, people wanting updates for various cars and side-by-sides, et cetera. Uh, buddy tracking is something that's on my list. These are a lot of big projects, some of them bigger than others, but the ball is rolling on a lot of these projects, some a little bit faster than others. I, my method of getting things done is very often having multiple irons in the fire, knowing that there's going to be roadblocks of various types along the way and to eliminate just wasted time uh, when those roadblocks do occur and I have to put that on the shoulder of somebody else uh, such as a support person at a um, chip manufacturer which is actually what happened earlier this week that I'm not just sitting and waiting I can pivot to another project while I'm waiting to hear back from them so I'll often have multiple things kind of rolling forward at the same time, which makes it difficult to give firm ETAs on when some of these things are going to be done. But overall, big picture wise, I feel like it's the most efficient because I don't like sitting still and twiddling my thumbs. So just kind of keep, keep all the balls rolling and then depending on what obstacles pop up and how efficiently they are handled, um, you know, something more complex might end up getting finished before something seemingly simpler. It just depends. Excellent. Excellent. Well, cool. Is there uh, anything else that we haven't discussed that, uh, that you'd like to talk about? I mean, the only other avenue of interest, I mean, just stuff about me. I mean, I was in scouts. Um, I mean, it was because of scouts is why I got into ham radio actually. So I play with radio a lot, uh, not professionally, but, uh, I do get a lot of radio questions. I help a lot of friends and friends of friends tune their antennas for the race radios and stuff like that. I, I solve a lot of those those problems. More for fun, though. Uh, like even just yesterday, I had an inquiry through the business about radio stuff, and I referred them elsewhere. But it's not that I don't know about radio. It's just not part of my business. And, um, you know, PCI does a good job with a lot of that stuff. I have a good working relationship with them. So it's, um, you know, there, there's a lot of players in that market, but nonetheless, I love playing with radio, not just on VHF stuff, but the worldwide stuff on ham radio too. So it's from a scientific standpoint, it's fun to tinker. I can understand that. I, I have avoided getting involved with ham just for the simple fact of time. 
Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I use, I, I have race radios in every vehicle that we own, um, including the semi truck so that we can communicate when we're using multiple rigs or out, out at an, a park or something like that. Um, handhelds, I've probably got like 20 handhelds. Um, I've got, uh, probably half a dozen ICOM small radios that, uh, that are sitting in totes waiting, you know, that are set up as portables for, you know, with a mag, mag mount antenna and all that kind of stuff for, for during race situations or when we had, we're running dirt riot, had uh, recovery rigs out there on course. I could, you know, easily just tap into their power supply and, and they'd be set up with a race radio. But um, eventually, you know, I hope to use all that stuff doing social runs where, you know, the guy, the people that come out to do the run with us, if they don't, if they aren't equipped with, with the radios that we can, we can make sure everybody can talk to each other, communicate. Yeah. I love them so much more than the FRS radios. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Don't even get me started. Or even back in the day when everybody on the trail, just running four wheel drive trails was, was using CB oh, geez. and yeah, right. <laughs> and the interesting thing is in, in the forest right there, they're absolutely terrible. But more than that is most CB radios are built so poorly to begin with. And then there's most people don't understand radio and coaxial losses. You know, don't pinch the coax, don't kink the coax, don't cut open the coax. And then you got you still got to tune the antenna and nobody... I don't say nobody, but most people don't have the equipment to make the system work properly, regardless if it's CB, GMRS, FRS, uh, even the race radios. There are people that complain that they don't work right, but it's because they haven't been set up right. So it's not the radio. It's it's all in just getting it to work the way it's supposed to. And it's it's definitely not a set it and forget it kind of, of thing. You don't just unravel the stuff out of the box and plug it in. And it works. It's there's a lot of environmental factors to uh, that affect how the the system works. So it's it's something that I think somehow needs to be addressed in in educating people that are purchasing this stuff. That you you know you don't just open the box and, and use it. You you still have to set it up and set it up right. Very true. I've always relied on PCI for that. And uh, they've done a pretty good job. I, I did communications or, you know, for a couple of different teams down in Baja, whether they were trophy truck or, you know, Jeep speed or class seven, whatever. And uh, it was yeah. uh, it was amazing that I always had a radio that could get out, get out clearly and then receive better than everybody else. Yep. And that's a really, really big thing is, is the receive, right? You might be getting out, but you also might not just be receiving <laughs> properly. Correct. And a lot of that comes down to coax and tuning as well. Cause if those things aren't addressed properly, the, uh, the signal loss that you experience both transmitting and receiving are, are so massive and they're, they're compounded problems as, as well. So if, your coax isn't in optimal condition and but you can have a coax that's in suboptimal condition and an antenna that is tuned perfectly and vice versa and so it though it, it becomes an exponential issue when these things start to affect each other true yep yeah cool well steven i want to say thank you very much for for spending the time today to um, talk with us about your, your history and, and, you know, everything that you got going on. I'm really, I'm really interested in uh, what's going on with rugged routes and your mapping with the Lowrance. Um, yeah. I use it all across the country. Got three discs that I, or cards that I put in for different parts of the country, but it's, you know, it's not real accurate. Um, you know, it's not perfect in any sense of the word, but luckily I know, you know, I use my Lowrance for, like I said, getting out of, getting back out of places, but also to, uh, 
to to lay down something if I need somebody to that wants to go in behind me. So, yep, uh, that's always... absolutely. And yeah, you know, I'm going to get some stuff in your hands that will be more up to date, more accurate than than what you've been using. We can definitely address that. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to. Uh, I was really excited to talk about this stuff with you, and really excited about just kind of uh, given given this stuff a lot more attention that I wasn't able to give it the last handful of years. So I, I haven't gone anywhere, but I recognize that production of new things has slowed drastically, but uh, things are shaping up and, and I'm really, really excited and looking forward to it myself as well. Well, great. Glad to hear that. So um, okay. have a great day and uh, we'll talk, we'll talk again soon. Sounds good. Uh, Thanks right, a bunch, Steve. Rich. Talk Thank you. Have a Bye-bye. Time. Yep. Well, that's another episode of Conversations with Big Rich. I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you could do us a favor and uh, leave us a review on any podcast service that you happen to be listening on, or send us an email or a text message or a Facebook message, and let me know uh, any ideas that you have, or if there's anybody that you have that you think would be a great guest, please forward the contact information to me so that we can uh, try to get them on. And always remember, Live life to the fullest. Enjoying life is a must. Follow your dreams and live life with all the gusto you can. Thank you.